Welcome to the second annual web-based academic vision for excellence seminars, also known as WAVES, which is hosted by the Wyoming Department of Education and the Special Education Programs Division. We are really appreciative of your time and effort to learn from local and national presenters on important topics that impact educators, students, and families across our whole state. I am Dina Smith with the Wyoming Department of Education and I'm going to be moderating for you today. I also have Jeff Hatcliffe who's hosting and Jennifer Duncan who's helping behind the scenes as well as um, from some folks from Research ILD with Dr. Lynn Meltzer and Caitlin Vanderberg. So thank you both for being here today. I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping announcements and then we will, we will begin. We do encourage you to participate and ask questions throughout the presentation by posting your questions in the chat and your questions are going to be answered following the presentation. Dr. Meltzer has, is going to allow some time at the end. So please post your, your questions in the chat box all along the session and we will capture those and bring them up as we can. Um, presentation recordings and materials are going to be available at the Wyoming Instructional Network for the remainder of the school year. The recording of this session will be available until June 30th, 2022. So please watch for that link to be provided in the chat box during the session as well. Please note that there's been a change in obtaining PTSB and or STARS credit for this year. There will be a WAVE summer fall PTSB form emailed to all registered participants, which will list all sessions from sessions starting from August through November. Participants will be responsible to track their own hours of attendance for the WAVES conference for this summer and fall semester. And then you will submit just one of those PTSB forms after the final session on November 9th, 2021. The submission deadline for that for the, the summer and fall semester will be December 15th for all of those sessions. No forms are going to be accepted after the 15th of December. PTSB credit will be submitted by WDE once attendance has been verified. There will be a separate PTSB submission form for the winter and spring wave session, which will begin in January and end in May 2022. If you are seeking STARS credit, please contact Jennifer Duncan and her information will also be put in the chat box during this session. At the end of this session, please fill out an evaluation. Your feedback is really valuable for us to help and it helps to drive the future planning of webinars and events. The link will be posted in the chat box and all links will be included in a follow-up email that you should receive within 24 hours of this session. When you submit your evaluation, you will be entered into a drawing to win a prize for your school or classroom. Today's prize, we're going to actually be offering one of Dr. Lynn Meltzer's books titled Promoting Executive Function in the Classroom, What Works for Special Needs Learners. So we're really excited for that and winners will be contacted via email after that, after their, that name is selected. Today's session is the first of four sessions regarding executive function from the Research ILD group, and we're really excited to have you join us. The remaining sessions will be held October 7th, 14th, and the 21st. So make sure that you get registered for each individual session, as each one of those sessions are gonna take a different focus surrounding executive functioning skills and strategies such as stress reduction and flexible thinking, motivation and engagement. And finally, we're going to end with fostering flexible mindsets and early learners. So I'm very excited to have everyone join us for those. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today who is Dr. Lynn Meltzer. She is the director of the Institutes for Learning and Development, which is Research ILD and ILD in Lexington, Massachusetts. She is a fellow and past president of the International Academy for Research and Learning Disabilities. She is the founder and program chair of this annual learning, the annual learning differences conference, which she has chaired for the past 35 years. For 30 years, she was an associate in education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Child Development at Tufts University. 
Her 40 years of clinical work, research, publications, and presentations have focused on understanding the complexity of learning and attention problems. Her extensive publications include articles, chapters, and books. Most recently, The Executive Function in Education, From Theory to Practice in 2018, Promoting Executive Function in the Classroom in 2010, and The Power Appears in the Classroom, Enhancing Learning and Social Skills 2015, and co-edited with Karen Harris together with her research ILD, ILD staff. She has developed SMARTS, an, an evidence-based executive function and peer mentoring coaching curriculum for middle and high school students. She has been an, an invited speaker at numerous national and international conferences, including the International Association for Cognitive Education Conference in South Africa. She has been honored with a number of awards, including the Council for Learning Disabilities, Outstanding Research Award in October 2015, and the Innovative Program of the Year Award with CHAD, C-H-A-D-D, which is the Children with Attention Deficit Disorders. I have to tell you, I actually had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Lynn Meltzer speak at the 34th Annual Learning Differences Conference, which was held at Harvard University back in March of 2019. And during that conference, the uh, actually the elementary SMARTS curriculum, which I think she might touch on today, was actually um, unveiled and introduced during that conference, which it was finally launched later at that for that next school year. So I'm very excited for you to hear all about this. And I know that um, you'll be hearing a lot more exciting things from her. So with I will now just stop and turn the time over to Dr. Lynn Meltzer. Dr. Meltzer, it is such an honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and uh, we're really excited to be here with you and excited that you know it's the end of uh, it's the end of the week and it's the beginning of the school year. I know how how many things so many of you have to do and, and the demands of school, especially during this um, rather difficult year with COVID. So thank you for attending. And so what, what I'd like to do is just tell you a tiny little bit about our organization in case so, so that you, and I hope that you'll take a look at our websites and take a look at some of the resources that we have available that may interest you. So Research ILD that um, is, the, is, is one part of the Institutes for Learning and Development, where we focus on research and development and professional development and um, publications of um, strategies that help kids to learn how to learn. Our focus has always been on the how of learning. How do we empower students to learn how to learn more efficiently and more effectively um, so that they can succeed not only in school, but also in life. And then on our ILD side, which is the Institute for Learning and Development, this is our clinical side of our organization where we involve, where we see students one-on-one -on -one for complicated neuropsychological assessments, educational therapy, speech and language therapy. And now we're actually with, with COVID, we, we, we're getting referrals for all of our one-on-one -on -one services from across the country because obviously it can be done remotely now. So today, the focus of our presentation will be executive function and metacognition, the keys to unlocking success and reducing anxiety. And what I'll, what I'll be focusing on is giving you a broad brushstroke of sort of some of these issues, why they are important, and hopefully you'll have some take, I uh, hope that you all sort of go away, sort of having so a few things that you can implement tomorrow in your classrooms. Um, and Caitlin, uh, Caitlin Vanderberg will be uh, working with working with me on this presentation. We have a number of activities that we'd like you to just um, to to respond to, and through the chat. And so she'll be will be going back and forth with some of those hands-on activities, so that we can so that you can really have a, a, an understanding of some of the issues that you can do with your students. Um, so executive function processes, as you all know, are essential for most daily activities. And with 
the pandemic and with um, remote learning, with hybrid learning, with all the different variations that you've had to had to experience over the past year, I think most of us have re most of us have realized the challenges of exec of having any executive function weaknesses. So if you think about it, every single activity daily activity involves involves what we view as core executive function processes, planning and organizing, thinking flexibly, uh, self-monitoring, memorizing, going to the, so for example, if you are going to the supermarket, you have to go in with some plan in advance as to what you want to get. Um, you know, even going down the cereal aisle could take you two hours if you don't know exactly what you're going to get. Um, and, you know, what type of cereal and what size cereal you want to use and what your budget is and how many people in your household you're trying to feed for how long. Um, so grocery shoppy, shopping um, in, is heavily dependent on executive function if you want to be efficient and not spend the night in, in the supermarket. Similarly, planning a vacation, which hopefully you're all able to do over the summer, um, involves a huge amount of executive function in terms of planning and organizing, prioritizing, figuring out what your budget is in advance, where you want to go, where you want to stay. And with COVID, there were extra layers of executive function that were involved because you had to figure out how safe it was, how you were going to get there, um, what you know, what the situation was with vac vaccinations, and um, would you need to quarantine before you could begin your vacation? Uh, so, so the layers of executive function uh, processes are enormous. Similarly, for students playing on a, on a, in, on any sports team, involves a huge amount of planning and organizing, figuring out where to kick the ball uh, on a soccer team, who to kick it to in what direction so they don't kick it to the opposition players um, and you know how to how to follow it and, and wh where do you want that ball to go and also and of course academic work reading writing math um, the problem solving elements as well as the computational elements and the um, and the uh, the decoding aspects of reading and writing all involve executive function processes um, so our work over the past well, 30 years has really focused on strategies, um, which are now commonly referred to as executive function. And, and we have written 10 books at this point um, focused on this as, as well as general strategies. And hopefully you'll take a look at some of them. If you want more information about executive function, our SMARTS curriculum that you heard a little bit about uh, is, a, is a 30 lesson um, curriculum, which takes the entire year and can actually take two years if you, uh, it's modular, um, for teaching the five core executive function processes that I'll talk about. Um, and it involves, there are hundreds of, of um, strategy sheets. There are PowerPoints for you to use in your classrooms so you don't have to develop anything uh, independently. There are activities for students. There are lesson plans that are, that are very specific. And we have an elementary curriculum, as you heard, as well as a middle and high school curriculum. So the elementary curriculum, some of which pages look like this, we call it Smarts Elementary. Um, and by the way, right now we're working on a homeschool version as well. So SMART stands for Strategies, Motivation, Awareness, Resilience, Talents, and Success. And SMART is research-based. It targets executive function strategies in the context of, of the academic curriculum. Our research and the research of all of the experts in the field um, are consistent that teaching executive function strategies in isolation is not going to work. You need to be able to teach it in the context of the academic curriculum. So our SMARTS our SMARTS curriculum includes examples from social studies, from science, from English language arts, from math, uh, and you can embed it in your daily curriculum. The idea is for you not to feel like you're sort of like it's a huge add-on, but rather that it seamlessly embeds in your in whatever you're teaching in the classroom day to day. And it's and as I said, we have an elementary, a middle, and a high school component of the curriculum. And the focus throughout is on teaching students to learn how to learn, 
with sort of the core part and component being some of the issues I'll talk about today, metacognitive awareness. How do we help students to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are in the learning areas and what strategies work well for them? So SMARTS actually just for interest is now being used in 45 states across the country and in and also in 25 countries, which makes us really happy. And we hope some of you will also become part of our SMARTS community. Um, it means you'll have access to a lot of our free materials, our blogs, our additional information. We have a, we have a monthly newsletter that goes out to SMARTS users and you can share strategies with others. And as, as I said, as we um, transition back into the classroom from being sort of 100% uh, remote learning of this past year, then to hybrid, and now being in the classroom, students are in masks. Uh, there has been so much of a need for students to become independent learners and to figure out so much more complicated time management strategies and um, to figure out how to schedule their homework and how to figure schedule their studying for tests when they've been much more isolated. And um, thank goodness they're back in the classroom, but there are new challenges, as we all know. So I want to start with just a little bit of, an, of a survey for you, which Caden's going to help me with. Thinking through back to, 20 to 20, 2020 to 2021, the school year, were you on overload? And the questions that we want you to address in this little survey are, um, which Caden's going to put in the chat, uh, is going to sh show and we'd like you to respond in the chat uh, through um, to the survey and we'll sort of show you the statistics relating to your group in terms of questions like how do you feel when you are on overload and um, and we'll go through sort of some of the issues we ask you to answer the questions in terms of yes or no. So Caitlin, over to you. Great, thank you so much. So here we are, we have I have six responses and more coming in out 12 right now. So right here for that first question, as many can probably assume, 100% of um, respondents said yes, that they feel overwhelmed when they are in overload, frustrated, 96%, unable to begin a task, a little bit of a different split here, 73.5% say yes, 27.8% say no. Unable to solve a problem, similar breakdown to the question before. About 65 say yes, 36 say no. Stuck, we have another similar split here, 77% yes, about a quarter say no. And lastly, unable to connect with others. About 60 said yes, 60% said yes, and about 40% said no. Thank you. Thank you for completing that so quickly. Um, so should I take over the screen again? Sure. Hopefully this will work. Oh, gosh. Um, for some reason. So just go and share screen, uh, Caitlin, because it's mm -hmm. not. Yes, if you oh. click the share there screen button. Looks okay, great. so thank you. So these were the questions you just answered. And as you saw, the, um, the majority, even up to 65 or 70% of you was, were saying that when you feel overwhelmed, it really, it really does affect your ability to solve problems and your, your, social, your social flexibility. So think about your students in these situations, how they feel when they're on overload. And academically, students often do feel on overload as the, as the year goes on. So if you think about metacognitively, what are the things that go through your mind when you feel on overload? Well, my brain feels clogged. I don't know where to begin. I feel stuck. This is too much for me. I'm giving up. Many of your students just do this during homework, right? It's like, I can't deal with this. I'm giving up. I'm going to sort of call my friend. I'm going on FaceTime. Um, you know, I'm exiting the whole homework situation. I can't figure out what to focus on. It all seems important. And I'm so frustrated. So these are some of the thoughts 
and the emotions and the anxiety that some of your students might experience uh, as the academic year goes on. And we know that this is sort of the beginning of the year, but as we know, October, late October into November is when the curriculum starts breaking up in terms of complexity. And when some of your students who seem to have been doing well suddenly start to begin to experience difficulties. And often it's because of executive function challenges. We're sort of at the younger level, kids feel like this. I thought this was pretty expressive, but we know this is across the board, the age band, including ourselves. This is how we often feel when we're on overload. So today, what we're gonna focus on are a number of questions that address these issues. First of all, we'll very briefly talk about what is executive function. Then we'll talk about why are these executive function strategies critically important for input class as well as remote teaching and learning. We'll talk about what is metacognitive awareness. This will be a sort of a big focus of today's presentation. How do we foster metacognitive awareness so that we can promote students self-understanding and so students learn how to learn. We'll then address what classroom-based survey systems can help students and teachers to understand students' executive function profiles. How do we teach EF strategies to promote metacognitive awareness? And lastly, what smart strategies can we teach? And I'm just going to touch on that because people, whenever I get presentations, ask, sort of, like, well, can you just show us a few examples? So we'll touch on a few examples. We'll go into more depth about those strategies next week and the following week. Donna Kincaid will be joining me next week when we talk about cognitive flexibility, and she'll take you through two of the actual smart strategies. And the following week, Michael Gresham, our smart director, will be, um, will, be, will be showing you some of the strategies in greater depth as well. So I want to begin with a quote from a student who I'm going to call Ben, who, um, who is now a young adult and very successful, but he had struggled through school right from first grade. And we'll show you a little video clip from him um, about halfway through this presentation as well. His point was that there's so much emphasis placed in our society on being smart and successful. And for kids with learning and executive function difficulties, who feel like learning is outside of their control, this can feel like a death sentence. And we know that you, kids, um, you don't, kids don't have to have learning and attention, diagnose learning and attention problems to have executive function weaknesses. Most of us have, as you've probably experienced this year, most of us have some weak, relative weaknesses in one of these areas. And so sometimes school can feel very challenging. And for kids with attention problems and learning issues, those are, are even greater. Those difficulties and challenges are even more pronounced. So um, Chase, 22 years, also very successful, now went teaching and social work. Being a kid with executive function difficulties is incredibly stressful. It's horrifying. You have no idea what you missed. You're disoriented, you're embarrassed, you're often mad at yourself, and you're filled with a feeling of helplessness. The stress is often overwhelming. Um, so this relationship in, the, in at the title of this presentation, we, we sort of talked about strategy, um, the importance of metacognitive awareness, executive function, and um, reduction of stress and anxiety, because the whole, the whole combination can create, can be lethal for some students. So the paradigm, the theoretical paradigm that underlies all of our work is this one. And I just want to mention for those of you who didn't realize it, you know, we did send a handout and, and, and readings in advance and everything is in your handout, um, which, and we also left sort of space for notes on the side of it. So if you print it out or if you have it on your desktop, you can follow along uh, with that or make notes and print it out afterwards. And it is a writable P PDF. So um, the theoretical paradigm that underlies our work is that Metacognition or the ability to think about how you think and learn, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, is sort of the underpinning of a very, very important framework which underlies executive function strategies. Those interact with effort, self-concept, and emotional regulation. And when you, all of those are addressed, then students, we build students' resilience and academic success. And so our job as educators is to try to promote these, all of these areas as much as possible. 
the metacognitive awareness and the executive function strategies. Because when we give kids a toolbox of executive function strategies, their self-concept improves, their emotional regulation improves, and their academic performance improves. So let's talk briefly about what is executive function. And I know two hours is a long, is a, it seems like a long time, but to cover this entire area, I really am giving you broad brush strokes um, so that you have a sort of an overview. And if you want to more detail, I hope that you'll take a look at some of our, at our website or at some of our um, publications or with some of our smarts materials. So executive function is really an umbrella term for all of the very complicated cognitive processes that control flexible behavior that's also goal-directed. So that flexibility, the ability to shift. And, it, and these, the executive function also implies that there's coordination and synthesis of different processes and subskills. So it's that integration that your kids, that your students have to go through. And I always use the analogy of a Rubik's cube because the core executive function processes that we emphasize in our model are goal setting, organizing and prioritizing, shifting flexibly, self-monitoring and memorizing, the working memory, being able to juggle information in your mind like you expect your kids to do in math or when they have to take notes in class or they have to listen to instructions and also write like I'm asking you to do right now. Those are all the core executive function processes, but these five processes interact with each other. They're really not independent. So as, as you'll see today, and especially next week when we talk, when Donna Kincaid and I talk about shifting cognitive flexibility in more detail, cognitive flexibility is really underlies all of these areas. You have to be flexible to set goals and to shift goals. You have to be flexible to organize and prioritize and to go back and forth. And to self and to check your work and edit. And similarly, you have to have all of these processes um, in place. So, um, so, the, so the interaction is important to remember. And the analogy that's often used in, when we talk about executive function is that of a, of a conductor, an orchestra conductor who's pulling together all these instruments and these players to try and make, to make beautiful music. And this is just, I just showing you examples from our smart elementary curriculum. We ask kids after we discussed, after the teachers discussed executive function to draw a diagram of what they think executive function is. And this was a seven, a seven year old actually, who drew a picture of an orchestra and the conductor. So why are these executive function strategies so important um, for learning? Well, if you if take a look at this uh, illustration, I mean, kids are often are overwhelmed by the requirements, especially now where they have to learn, where over this past year, they've been required to learn independently to a much greater extent. They've had to structure the minutes and the hours of each day to a much greater extent independently. When they were in school, as they are now, um, you as teachers tend to do this to a much greater extent then students are required to, but when they have to work independently at home or do their homework or study for tests, they're required to do this. They have to estimate the time needed for their schoolwork, their sports activities and their friends. They have to schedule a piece, appropriate piece of learning. And of course, as we know, social media plays a huge part in students' lives now, and it takes up a huge part and it can take up 90% of a kid's school day if, um, parents and teachers and kids themselves allowed it. So these executive function strategies are critically important and becoming more and more important over time. And oh, I apologize. Um, as I said, the core processes are goal setting, organizing and prioritizing, flexible, cognitive flexibility, working memory and self-monitoring. There is so much information coming into the brain all at the same time. During the, during the school day for kids and after the school day when they're doing homework and studying and studying for tests. And if kids can't sort and sift and prioritize and organize, that information can get stuck. So the paradigm we use is that of a clogged funnel. For kids who have a clogged funnel, these are the kids who go home, try to do their homework and sit at the computer for an hour. <clears throat> and their parents will say, they're really working hard, they're doing their homework and at the end of it, there's nothing to show. 
I'll study for hours for a test and then do really poorly. That funnel is clogged because they don't have the executive function strategies needed to get that information smoothly moving through. And that leads to, that, that's where the stress and the anxiety come in. That's the, the emotional regulation. To quote a young kid, I get so frustrated when I have all these ideas in my mind. I can't figure out how to start writing. I just get stuck and I give up. So writing, which involves multiple subskills and processes, regardless of whether it's at the younger grades, the first two grades in school, or whether it's at the highest levels of high school, involve a huge amount of executive function. And as you can see from this model of ours, as I've just been saying, executive function is also interconnected with attention, effort, and emotional regulation. So if a student has a toolbox of executive function strategies and can easily organize and prioritize and figure out what's important, then they tend to be more attentive. Their attention is, improves in the classroom. Um, their effort improves because, the, and it's what we call focused effort, which is really important. So they focus their effort in the appropriate um, way and they can get their work done. And they are more emotionally regulated, meaning they're, self, they're not as anxious, they're not as stressed, um, their self-concept improves and they can be successful. So it's really important to keep these issues in mind. If you have a student who's, who's misbehaving in class or whose attention is out the window, um, all of these factors are interacting. And sometimes we need to look at this executive function base. So to quote Ben, when he was in seventh grade, he said, when I got a big assignment I didn't understand, I got so angry because I just spent an hour staring at a blank word document and I couldn't figure out how to start. It was really tough and incredibly stressful. So just an example of that interaction I just talked about, he didn't have the toolbox to get started on that assignment. And so his anxiety built up and his stress level built up and he got more. That funnel was just clogged and he couldn't get out. He couldn't figure out how to get it unclogged. So what is metacognitive awareness? That's a big piece. So for, for Ben, he didn't understand what was going on. He didn't understand why he was having problems. He didn't understand what he could do about it. So let's talk about the metacognitive awareness piece because it, this is critically important to help students. So when we talk about metacognitive awareness, we talk about kids' self-understanding. How do I think? How do I learn? How do my strengths and weaknesses affect my learning? And what strategies work best for me? Because all strategies don't work well for all kids all of the time, the same strategies. They need to adjust those strategies. They need to adjust them based on the curriculum as well and based on the developmental level. So we're not gonna have exactly the same strategy for a second grader as we do for an eighth grader. They might, but it could be a variation on the same strategy. So what you'll see, um, if you look at any of our curricula, is that the strategies, we talk about the same areas, the strategies are effectively very similar, but they're adjusted based on the curriculum expectations and the developmental level of the student. So at a very young age, it's metacognition, um, you know, getting kids to think about what am I thinking? I'm noticing, I'm wondering, I'm seeing, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm realizing. And at, at the older level, the middle and high school level, it's like, how do I think about my thinking? I'm not sure what this is about. How do I figure out the main ideas in this, in this reading or, or my social studies or science? How do I get started with my writing? What do I know about this topic? And, you know, in, if it's, it could be complex biology, it could be um, complex history. And where did I get stuck on this math problem? What's getting in the way? And what's the big idea in this math problem? So I'm going to give you a very quick task to look to rate your approach to your work as a teacher, a professional, as a parent on a one to five scale. And Caitlin's gonna, um, gonna also to, so take a look at the chat box and we'll see where all of you rate yourselves. So over to you, Caitlin. Great, thank you. The survey is in the chat, so um, you can go ahead, open that up and start responding while I switch screens here. Okay. 
I'm just gonna wait a minute for some responses to come in. I'm sure they'll come pouring in. So we have about 12 responses so far. And for number one, organizing my time and belongings, um, four, um, and four is the majority, 23 people have responded. And moving on to checking before beginning other activities. We have a similar spread here with um, four receiving the most, almost 50% of responses. And similar here, figuring out what's at the top of your to-do list every day. About 47% of respondents went with four, 36% with five. And moving down here, now we're up to 82 responses. We have um, 44.6%, so 37, 38 people for number four. Trying new ways to solve problems when I'm stuck. We have a bit of a, of a different spread here, so more spread out. 16% um, of respondents choosing um, two, 32% choosing three, and about 38% choosing four. And then down here to setting goals, about 45% um, chose four, and about 24% chose five. Great, so I'm gonna Thank pass you, this back to you, Lynn. So it's really interesting, you're a, very, you're a strategic group. <laughs> um, because, and, and, it's very, but, and, and it's interesting from your point of view to see the, um, to see this, the spread. Because think about this, we're giving, I'm giving this to you so that you can sort of use this as a, as a model of paradigm for your, class, for your class, your students in your classroom. There's going to be a spread across your classroom of some students who really think of themselves. These was one question in each of this, uh, on the survey about each of those executive function areas. So some kids, some of your students are going to be very highly organized. Others are going to be very flexible. Others are going to self-monitor well and so that's what um results in that spread of of responses as you just saw with with yourselves um and think about it as teachers we can't teach the way we learn because we have students with the entire range of um profiles in our classrooms so we have to sort of teach across across these areas and recognize that there's going to be a, a spread of uh, strengths and challenges. And that's the whole focus of our work in metacognitive awareness, that kids begin to understand that everyone, that many other kids will learn the same, so similarly to them, but many kids are going to learn differently. And they need to understand their own learning so that they can select the strategies that work for them. So how do we foster metacognitive awareness so that students learn how to learn? So once again, the interaction between metacognitive awareness and executive function, I'll take you through each of these areas, like goal setting. How do I set doable goals? Might be some of the questions that kids might ask. So you, you want to try and get kids to start asking themselves these questions. Organization, how do I organize my time and my ideas? The fact that they're reflecting and they're being metacognitive is a huge step towards getting them to implement these strategies. Prioritizing, how do I figure out what's most important for my reading and writing? Cognitive flexibility, an example, what is another way I can solve this math problem? Or study for this test. Working memory, how do I remember all these details for my quizzes and tests? And self-monitoring, how do I find my mistakes when I check my work so that I can self-correct and I don't miss a lot of my errors? Um, so those, if you can, if you can stimulate your students to ask those questions, that's a huge step towards success for them in terms of using these executive function strategies. And so I'm going to give you some uh, some examples from Smarts and from my curriculum I sprinkled through my my presentation today. So coming back to Ben, 
Um, his point about being in school was that my teachers and parents tried dozens of approaches to help me stay organized and engaged in the classroom. I still struggled. I felt so anxious and frustrated and kept hoping that somebody could help me understand how to learn more easily. So this is, so Ben recognized that he was struggling. He was frustrated. He didn't know how to approach his work, but he had no idea what the core of the problem was, what he had to do about it, and all his parents and all his teachers. So that's this metacognitive awareness. So how do we foster this? I'm going to touch on four, um, really in the main three major um, components that we can work on. Know yourself in diagrams, metacog surveys, strategy reflection sheets, and strategy boards using social, and you could use social media if kids are remote as well. But look at this, um, I've used this visual deliberately. You have a cat looking in the mirror and seeing a lion. It's not an accurate self-perception. You want to help kids to improve, not to overblow their strengths and not to underplay um, their strengths either, but to have a very uh, accurate and balanced understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. That's what fostering metacognition is about. And you, at the beginning of the school year, I'm hoping you will use some of this part of the school year to help kids move in that direction. So as part of our smart curriculum, actually, we, we teach this and then we ask kids to younger students, especially to draw, to draw a diagram or what it means, what metacognition means. So this was an eighth grader, uh, I'm sorry, an eight-year-old saying, metacognition is thinking about yourself and having self-awareness. And she recognized that math was her major challenge. So she said, I need to think, she drew out what I need to do. I need to focus on improving my math. I need to think of my strengths and weaknesses in math. I need to practice my math problems. I need to improve my math skills and have self-awareness. And so her thought bubbles are, I will practice my math problems regularly. So diagramming this is sort of, clearly she's a kid who understands what her weaknesses are and what she's going to do about it. That's the issue. She's a plan. At the older levels, so the, this is the um, what we call the Know Yourself in Diagrams. If we ask students like Ben, who is in high school, to complete what are my strengths? What are my challenges? And then what are the, and they can choose from the areas above. And then what, are, what am I going to do about it? So an example of a student sort of competing where the student said, I need to understand what I read or my strengths. I'm good at science. I'm good at history. I'm good at technology. But what are my weaknesses? Remembering things for tests, paying attention. So this was been at an earlier age. And then the next question is choose one of your strengths. Why do you think this is a strength and what things do you do in daily life to make it a strength? And he said, I know, I understand what I read. And in daily life, I read and I study and I practice. So to just to show you so it's more legible, what Ben's Ben diagram looked like is my strengths are working hard. Because he's a very motivated kid. He was a very motivated student. Remembering things for tests, understanding what I read, learning new strategies and solving math problems. What did he see as his challenges? Paying attention, organizing my things, organizing my time, taking notes on what I read and checking my work. So you can see sort of his overview of his strengths and weaknesses. Um, so that's what we, so that's a very brief overview of these Venn diagrams and it's something you can do tomorrow in your classes. Just tell kids to draw a little Venn diagram strength and put strengths and challenges and to just write down what they think their strengths are and what their challenges are. It'll get kids thinking. It'll give you a sense. And if you have a little discussion in class, not a long one, um, it'll, get, it'll get kids beginning to think about how they think and how they learn. So the second piece of building fostering building metacog words is about metacog surveys. So I'm going to show you, and I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on these surveys today. So the metacog system is a series of questionnaires that we develop for use in the classroom. They, in a 45 minute period, you can give all these questionnaires to your students. We've done it over and over with thousands of students. The MERS is a motivation, effort, and resilience survey. Um, 
there are questions, items in this questionnaire that look at kids, get kids to rate themselves in terms of how hard they work, what they, how motivated they are. The stratus use, which is the strategy you serve, and I'll show you some work that we've done on that, which is very exciting. And then the tipsy, which is a teacher perception of students' effort survey. So the questions on the MERS are the same as the, as the tipsy, except the questions on the MERS are for the student and the question on the tipsy are for teachers. And so you have an exact comparison and I'll show you an example. So students rate themselves in a certain level of effort, teachers rate them, and you can see whether or not there's consistency or discrepancy. And it's a great way of beginning a sort of a discussion with that student about goals for the year. It's also a great um, resource that you, if you can use for parent for parent meetings that you have at the beginning of the school year. So to talk about Ben, who, as you saw, struggled in school, had no idea what his problems were when he was younger. Teachers had no idea. He's a very motivated kid. Break yourself on a scale. I have trouble breaking down my homework into smaller manageable parts. Um, he said he did. When I'm learning something new, I connect it to something I really know. He said he, he, said he, he, um, he was able to do that. I have trouble organizing my thoughts before I write. He has trouble with that. Um, and on many days, I forget to hand in my homework. Absolutely. So now let's compare his ratings and some of these items with his teacher's ratings. In general, my hard worker, he said, yeah, he rated himself a five. I'm a very hard worker. And teachers said, he's average. There was a discrepancy. Doing well in school is important to me. Absolutely. For, for Ben, it was absolutely critical. Um, the teacher saw him as not very interested in school. His teacher called him unmotivated, just the opposite of what he was. I spent as much time as needed to get my work done, a five. He did. He spent hours and hours and hours, but the quality didn't show it when he had it in his work in, um, in class the next day. And so the teacher rated him a three. I keep working even when the work is difficult, a four, and the teacher said a two. You can see that their perceptions are very different. The teacher just doesn't see him as as a student who's so highly motivated, but he's struggling. And part of the, the MERS as well, is we ask kids to have qualitative section. We ask kids to comment, to rate themselves. He said he was an above average student. How would you describe yourself? I work hard, but sometimes I don't succeed in what I do. How do you think your teachers would describe you? Hard worker um, at understanding concepts. How do you think your parents would describe you? Hard worker, but can get distracted really easily. That's the attention piece. Other comments, I get distracted by anything that catches my eye and it makes me pull away from my work. So he sees that he has attention issues as well. And what does the teacher say? Ben works hard when the task is structured. However, he has no self-confidence. His concentration is erratic. His grades, um, you know, reflect that. So the teacher does the teacher recognizes that he's a hard worker, but says, I don't know, his attention takes him away and he doesn't do well in school. So this information can really help you uh, at the beginning of the school year and can help Ben to understand what direction he needs to take in terms of helping himself. I'd like to show you just a sampling of students to self descriptions from the MERS and versus the tipsy. Um, from these questionnaires, this was, we were working, we did a research study in one of the schools. Um, we had about 300 students. And these are just a sampling of their comments. How would you describe yourself? Hardworking, scared to fail a test. I don't think I work as hard as I should. I work as, so, as hard as I can. I still don't get the best grades, a slacker. How do you think your teachers would describe you? Or, these are not the same students, but I'm just showing you a sample. Poor effort, disruptive, too talkative. Poor effort may fail for the year, um, another student said. Thought Another student said, well, my teacher would say that I have a pure, poor use of being smart and never do it, do my work. And another student said, I'm great, at, would say, says that his teacher would say that he's great at bouncing back. How do you think your parents would describe you? An annoying student, stubborn, talkative, peanut gallery. Another student said, my parents would describe me as horrible if I get anything below an A. That is really sad that this kid felt 
so pressured that he had to get an A and anything below that would just didn't cut, cut the mustard. Another student said, I'm all right. My parents would say I'm all right, but a B is unacceptable in all caps. The student, the pressure, the anxiety, the stress is also huge. Another student said, my parents would say he's smart, but his grades are lower than they should be. Another student, average, they don't believe it ever when I tell them I'm trying. And another student said his parents would say he's hardworking, but easily stressed. So you can see that kids actually have a sort of sense of how their parents and teachers view them, but they're not sure what to do about it. And that's where the executive function strategy is coming. So we've talked briefly about in terms of building metacognitive awareness, self-understanding, uh, in terms of know yourself in diagrams. Now we just talked about the metacog. Let's talk briefly about a third uh, approach, which is using strategy reflection sheets and strategy boards. So strategy reflection sheets are very, very easy to implement. You could begin implementing them tomorrow if you if you decided this, this system will help you to help your students. And I highly recommend this very easy. What you want to do is um, get kids to think about what strategy they used or writing assignment you give them at homework or, at, or preparing for a test or studying. So let me show you an example. This is a strategy reflection sheet that so when students what you can do is when students have take get their homework, one of the activities is you just say, I want you to write up what strategies did you use to, um, to complete this um, math homework or this writing homework. Um, and you don't have to do it every day, but twice a week or even once a week. And they get extra credit for, complete, for writing down the strategy. Similarly, when, they, when you give them a test, give them extra credit for writing down, where they have to write down at the, during the test, what strategy they used. That you build that strategy use in your classroom over the course of the year. Kids share their strategies and they learn from one another and they begin to think about process, not just about outcome. So an example, what strategy did you use to prepare for this test? These were seventh graders, same age, same classroom. The strategy I used was basically just write it and then check it over a few times. Pretty basic strategy. This student, same age, same classroom. Some strategies I used to prepare for this test where I used information I already knew to think up a basic outline and to fill in the gaps. I either used my notes, the textbook, or common sense. Um, Great, very strategic kid. So you want to go, you want to help your students get from that very basic level that you saw for the one student at the beginning of the year to a much more sophisticated level by the end of the year. And for every student, it's going to be different. But if you build the strategy use through using strategy reflection sheets, and you can do this one-on-one -on -one if those of you special education working with kids one-on-one -on -one or, um, uh, or, or in classes, and it doesn't matter what the size of the class is. Kids can share their strategies and you can build a cultural strategy use in your classes. To quote Ben, um, when he was 16, when you know what your strengths and weaknesses are, because he had this, he went through these activities with us at our institute, it gives you a different understanding of the work you have to do. It helps you reevaluate what you're doing. If I know I have a paper to write, I'll spend more time planning out and figuring out how to attack it differently. I will also feel calmer and not so stressed about my homework. So in other words, he built meta, we built metacognitive awareness. He, ben happened to be referred to us because he was struggling so much in school and nobody knew what the issues were. We did an evaluation and then we worked with him buying some educational therapy and focused on building metacognitive awareness and executive function strategies. Um, and his point was, I then began to understand how I learn. I then could plan when I had a writing assignment or, a, or had to study. And I'd spend my time planning, figuring out how to attack it. And then I felt less stress and was more successful. So this cycle of anxiety and stress, um, it then gets cut. And so stress reduction and reduction of anxiety is critical um for students 
And it makes a huge difference when they understand what their strengths and weaknesses are and what they can do about it, what executive function strategies they can use. So strategy boards are very, very wonderful ways of having students share their strategies in classrooms. This is a middle school teacher um, who, who had the students uh, share their strategies, put them on boards or on walls uh, at the elementary level where teachers are teaching most subjects. Teachers have often used one wall for each subject, like math, a math wall and an English a language arts wall and the social studies and kids share their strategies and discuss them once a week in a strategy share time, which can be very brief. It could be five or 10 minutes at the beginning of the school day, at the beginning of the lesson, five minutes. Um, where kids share their strategies because the value is, is incredible. So as part of our SMARTS curriculum, for those of you who um, decide to, to uh, tap into it or to become subscribers, every single lesson, we have a strategy share and a strategy reflection at the end. What strategy did you use? How did you use the strategy? Was it helpful? How do you know it was helpful? Getting things to reflect on the strategy and the value of the strategy. And for the younger kids, Smarts Elementary, we use um, this kind of format where it's, uh, sm you know, smiley faces, et cetera. So it's more um, doable for them to complete these strategy reflection sheets. So I wanted to give you a reflect reflection. Um, I'd like you to pick a task, think, just think about it, doing your taxes, cleaning out the garage, planning a trip, cooking a large meal, buying a car, or another activity that you think you'd like going to the supermarket. And I'd like you to think about a number of questions. What strategy did you use or would you use to complete the task? It could be past tense, it could be um, future. Was this an effective strategy? Well, it, actually, it should be past because I want you to think about was the strategy effective? Um, why or why not? And what will you do differently next time you do this task? Um, so, and then if you could share that in the chat, Caitlin will read out some of your responses, but the issue is to think about sort of a task that's heavily dependent on executive function and how you would approach that and how you think you would approach it in the future, what you learned from some errors you made. So you don't need to screen share for this, Caitlin, you'll just read out from the chat. Absolutely. So we have someone who said um, they are a big list maker. So making lists in order to cross items off as they complete them as a strategy. Any other, uh, any other ideas? What do other people do? So we have a couple of responses here. We have someone who um, chunked their tasks, some who researched options, and that could be um, if they were maybe planning a trip or buying a car. Uh, someone said they, the strategy they used was procrastinating or making a list or breaking it up into different parts to be successful researching and making a list of pros and cons. Um, for, the, for meal planning, pre-planning the meal and preparing the ingredients beforehand. We have someone who, um, let's see here, planning out stages, um, preparing things earlier on, organizing the information, putting it in order. So those were some of the strategies that were shared. And we have more in the chat here. Um, someone who says they like to figure out where to start first, as that's often the biggest hurdle. And some broke down their um, paying taxes plan. So schedule the appointment, make sure to be on time, have the necessary paperwork and ID, answer honestly and wait. And a lot of fans of lists doing research Yeah, creating calendars, comparing and contrasting. Wow, well, you're planning. a very strategic group for sure. <laughs> I 
Anything else? Should I? So as you can hear, there's really a range of strategies and, and list making is a big thing, uh, isn't it? And it's very important actually, because it helps you to, what do you do when you make a list? You prioritize and you organize and you, you put the sort of most important things at the top of the list, um, even if it's something you don't want to do, but you know it's important. Um, somebody said, calend you know, setting a calendar, so a timeline, setting goals. Um, that's what you're doing sort of in, in these situations. You're setting goals, you're prioritizing, you're organizing. You're shifting, you're saying, oh, I'll have to do that before, before I do something else that I really want to do. Um, my taxes are due in three days. <laughs> and I'm getting in trouble if I don't address them now. Or I have, you know, so many people coming to for a meal, I better start cooking a week before, that kind of thing. So it's all of these processes. And for you, the question is, if you know, have you used an effective strategy and how would you address it if you haven't? What would you do on another occasion? So moving on, I wanted to, before we move into some more specifics about um, a survey, we, the Metacog and some strategies for, for addressing, um, for, uh, some strategies from SMART. I wanted to show you, uh, have Caitlin show you just two one minute clips one from the person I was calling Ben, whose real name is Pilly, and one from Chase um, as adults talking about the, the importance of executive function. Thank you, Caitlin. No problem. Let me know if you can hear the audio when I play it. Sure. If you're here at this talk, you understand how having trouble prioritizing tasks can hurt your productivity. Um, but something that's often lost in the discussion, clearly not today, is how much it can hurt your sense of self-worth, um, your sense of competence, and your sense of just satisfaction in your day-to-day -day life. Those who live with executive function challenges, with executive dysfunction, um, we're used to being frustrated. We are used to failing. We are used to having things slip through the cracks, to having things pile up, to having things misplaced. Um, and over time, these instances compound into a narrative. And that story comes with some core beliefs. I'm not good at things. Uh, I can't get things done. I'm not reliable. I'm hyper. I'm a mess. I remember being asked by a teacher in middle school if I was retarded or just slow. And I remember my high school English teacher proudly announcing to the class that I would be receiving a special abbreviated test so that we could all get on with our lives. These stories are not unique to me, nor are they one-time occurrences for any child with a learning difference. And that has a cumulative psychological cost. Kids with learning differences grow up with a profound sense of shame and hopelessness about this situation. And unless there is someone there to say, no, you're not stupid and we can help you. They do what all human beings do. They avoid the problem. They block it out. Find a hole and stick their head in to block out the outside world. How do you fix that? Well, it's simpler than you'd think. You show them they're not alone. You create a community of people who learn and think differently and amazing things happen. Thank you, Caitlin. So we just wanted to give you a snippet um, of uh, you know, the experiences from, from, point, from students' perspectives of what it feels like to have some of these issues. Um, and and I've you know, been quoting Ben right through. So um, I showed you his Metacog. I showed you his uh, Know Yourself in diagrams. He's now, he, he's now a, a very successful research scientist working in organic chemistry. And his point is that, as with Chase, is that executive function strategies are what helped him to get over some of these challenges and to be successful in school and in college. So, Think about your students. I'm sure you uh, 
as we talk about this, think about the students in your classroom or classrooms, those of you who are middle and high school students, and which of your students might be having some of these same issues and what and how valuable it can be to get to just give students your students strategy reflection sheets that gets them to begin to reflect on their strengths and weaknesses and what they can do about it because you're empowering them and you're making them active learners. So I wanted to talk briefly about the classroom-based survey system that we do at the Metacog. And we're really excited because we have just put the Stratus, the Metacog, part of this Metacog system online so that students can take the survey online. And within a, as soon as they finish that survey, uh, they get a profile for themselves of what are their strengths and weaknesses in executive function. And the teacher gets the class profile and from there can figure out what strategies to teach. So we're, we've been developing this this year as a, the online version. We've been pilot testing it um, in, the, in the spring. Now we're pilot testing the final version with um, 23 schools across the country who applied to be selected. And the plan is that we will be rolling this out in January so that any of you can decide to, to subscribe to this and to use it in your classrooms. Um, so once again, I just wanna emphasize that the Metacog, we're trying to promote self-understanding every student using a developmental model so that kids ask themselves this question, how do I, these questions, how do I learn? How do I think? How do my strengths and weaknesses affect my learning? And what strategies work best for me? So the Metacog survey, and I talked briefly about that a few minutes ago, um, I showed you part of the stratus uh, and how Ben rated himself. We gave you a few, those five questions I asked you to rate yourselves on one to five. One, if, one, one question from each executive function area was from the stratus. So I wanna show you just a little snippet of our online version because we're so excited about it and know that the teachers who've been who we select as pilot are very very excited about using it and so the students and we'll show you the results of, of a mini survey so for example so these questions the 30 questions come up you know on online and students respond one question when i read or write i get caught up in the details have trouble finding the main idea students have to say never really sometimes usually always have to rate themselves or the goals I set for myself are difficult to reach, they rate themselves and so on through the 30 questions. At the end of that, immediately, they get a profile. So this student's profile showed that cognitive flexibility was a strength. So it says my EF strength, and you can see that in the pie chart, the, uh, the cognitive flexibility is sort of is emphasized as the strength is cognitive flexibility. Then it gives them a brief explanation of what that means both in academic work as well as socially. Cognitive flexibility means switching tactics to try and figure out something in a different way. Being flexible is important when there's a change in schedule at home or at school, when your friends wanna do something different than what you had in mind, and when you're reading, writing, taking notes or studying. So it relates the executive function process to their academic work, to sometimes we relate it to some of the after school activities and to social activities. More tasks that are related to cognitive flexibility, learning a new language, you have to be flexible, using basic math concepts to read charts, you have to go back and forth from the core concepts to the, to the details, making connections between text and real life scenarios, making a new friend involves flexibility, being willing to do the kinds of activities that that friend wants to, not just what you want to do beginning a new job um, as an adult or as a high school student or college student, playing a board game and changing the way you talk to friends depending on how they're feeling. So these are examples of cognitive flexibility. So we help them to understand that this cognitive flexibility is important across the lifespan. And then examples of ways you can build on your strengths, find and use a word that has more than one meaning, E.g. bark could mean a dog, spark, a tree bark, a chocolate dime, a chocolate bark. Look up some riddles. Um, you can tell your friends or family, I have no doors, but I have keys. I have no room, but I have a space. 
can enter, but you can never leave. What am I? Do any of you know? A keyboard. And then create a joke or riddle. And we'll talk more about these ideas next week when I focus on cognitive flexibility. Then the student also gets um, in the pie chart, the next set focuses on challenges. Notice we always focus on strengths first, always, just like in the Venn diagram I showed you. What are your strengths? How does that balance with your challenges? So self-monitoring and self-checking means finding and fixing one's own mistakes. So we struggle with self-monitoring when we don't check what we are doing. We have trouble setting goals for ourselves. Sometimes we can be easily distracted or unfocused what we are doing. We need help redirecting our attention. And then tasks that are related, checking and correcting classroom work, checking homework for mistakes and correcting it, proofreading a paper and making changes, learning a dance sequence, applying for a job, changing the way you talk or relate to a friend. So examples, and of course, there are many more. And you can have a discussion with your students if you choose that. And then um, what are ways you can improve? Put a post note by your desk with a, with a reminder to read over your work before you hand it in. Before you leave for school in the morning, ask yourself if you have all the items you need. So many kids, of course, leave half their homework at home. And when you log out of your computer for the day, check if you completed all your tasks. So those are examples of ways that, that kids can improve in their self-monitoring. And so the Metacog survey sort of gets them thinking about these issues and, and realizing that, wow, I'm not just, I, I can do something for myself. I can help myself improve. And then they get a list, and this is more for the teacher, a list of strategies from our SMARTS curriculum that can really be helpful for teaching this kid. These are like the top strategies that you can teach the student over the course of this year. The teacher gets a class profile as well. And this is really cool because at the end of this, is the stu your students take this questionnaire and it can take like 15 minutes or something that, if that. And at the end of the teacher gets this class pr profile uh, summary of what are the major strengths in your students in executive function and what are the major challenges. So five students um, had strengths in organizing and prioritizing in this class, two of them in working memory, and the major challenges for this class were working were goal setting and self-monitoring. And then it, it spells out, it gives it, the teacher a list of which students, um, of per student, what their strengths and weaknesses are. So Molly, who I showed you a few minutes ago, is listed here at the bottom as being strong in cognitive flexibility and weak in self-monitoring and self-checking. And then it gives a list to the teacher of the strategies that will make the most sense to teach for the entire class over the course of the year. Um, and we show the Rubik's cube all the time to point out that these strategies, that these processes relate to one another and the strategies interconnect. So for example, regardless of what the weaknesses are, these, these students um, need to understand, for example, why working memory is important or bottom up versus top down thinking. So there are a lot of, so these strategies all interconnect, but for, your, for, the, for Mrs. Smith's class, this profile, these are the smart strategies that would be most effective teaching over the course of the year. And I thought you'd be interested in some of the student data that we did a pilot that Caitlin ran with um, a lot of the students in our, in our spring pilot. We asked them, we wanted to see, is this something that kids are willing to, to um, complete? Was it something they're going to find boring and turn off? So question was ease of use. 92% of our students reported that taking the Metacog was easy. Have a look at this chart, so the blue. It's, um, it was really easy from their point of view. Strategies for improving. 79% of students reported that they'd use the smart strategies in the future. That is very powerful because as we know, students often don't on the surface embrace doing more using a strategy, but close on 80 percent that they would use these strategies. And applying the strategies, this is really important to their work. 62% said they would use these strategies for their classwork, 66% with homework, 57% said they'd use the strategies for test preparation, and 39% for sports and music. And obviously, this is a one-time administration for students 
if the teachers are then following up with teaching strategies in the classroom, then they become more aware of the value of these strategies and what they are. And um, these numbers are going to go up in a huge way. So just some comments from students. Uh, and this is across the board from sixth grade, we, so from sixth grade to 10th grade, a number of sixth graders said, I need to strengthen what it, after reviewing their profiles, they reported one thing they'd learned from the metacog. I need to strengthen my ability to set goals, said a sixth grader. Another set, yeah, sixth grader said, I learned that I can get smarter. Another sixth grader said, I need to work on my memory for assignments to help me get better. Another student said, I'd like to say thank you for helping me fix my challenges. That was really interesting. Another eighth grader said, to make goals for the future on things I have to improve on. And a tenth grader, I have the capacity to revise and reform what I do to become a better learner. So students, this really helped them to reflect and to feel like they had control over their learning, that they could do something about it, they could help themselves. And they had, just from taking the Metacog, before they were even taught these strategies. So it can be very powerful. We're really excited about um, making it available in a few months. So, um, the next question is, how do we teach these strategies to promote metacognitive awareness and to create strategic classrooms? And this, I'm going to sort of just spot check some of these issues. So I wanted to leave approximately the last um, close to 30 minutes for questions and answers. So our SMARTS curriculum, um, as I've been saying all along, emphasizes in building a metacognitive awareness. And that we, let, we overlay over that ex teaching executive function strategies. And also, if you have flexibility, if it's something you're interested in and can do, we strongly recommend a peer coaching or peer mentoring component, which is something we've implemented as part of some of the research studies that we that we were involved in with us with uh, executive function. Because if you can get kids, older kids, to mentor younger kids, students, or within the same classroom, have you pair kids, students with each other and then they switch roles. One is a mentor and one is a coach um, on one occasion and then they switch roles on another occasion. That sort of leads to sharing. And what we found in some of our studies is our mentors who are older students, high school students, who had never used these strategies, started using the strategies because they said, I can't mentor a younger student if I don't know how to use these strategies for my homework and if I don't use them in my homework. So they started using these strategies for their homework, which they previously had avoided. So once again, just a reminder about the paradigm, we are trying to get kids to unclog that funnel and to go from a situation where the funnel is clogged to a situation which you can see here where they have that aha moment like, oh, I know what I have to do. I know what I have to do to read and to write or to study for this test because I've learned those appropriate strategies. So as you teach these strategies, the importance is to use metacognitive prompts for teaching these strategies. Like asking that question, getting kids to ask themselves the question, what is the strategy? When is it most helpful? And how should the strategy be used? Because as I said earlier, not all strategies work for all, across all academic areas all of the time. And not all strategies are, the same strategy is not necessarily um, good for all students. So one student, depending on their metacognitive profile, is gonna need different strategies than another student. And students need to ask themselves those questions so they know what works for them. And so you want to go, as you teach these strategies, we want to move from a situation where your students are feeling overwhelmed, overloaded, anxious, pressured by the load of work and teach them strategies in all of these areas. So that apply to reading comprehension, written language, math problem solving, summarizing and note-taking, long-term projects, studying and test-taking so that they go from being overwhelmed to a feeling of calm and that they really do understand how they learn, they use these strategies and they can be more successful, be it in math or in social studies or in um, science or in 
English language arts. So let me show you um, as the last section of uh, my presentation today, a few, just touch on a few smart strategies that we can teach in order to promote metacognitive awareness. Um, and what these strategies are and how we can teach them. So um, this is sort of one of the pages from our SMARTS curriculum, as I said, as part of this online curriculum, which we rolled out about seven years ago. And um, as you had heard from Dina, Dina at the, uh, two years ago in 2019, rolled out the elementary curriculum. Um, within this SMARTS, either the, the middle high school curriculum and the SMARTS elementary curriculum. We have 30 strategies, as I mentioned, across the five areas. And I wanna just show you a sampling of, the, of a goal setting strategy to begin with and how it applies regardless of the age level. So we call it CAN-DO goals. CAN-DO stands for kids learning to set a goal that's clear so the C stands for clear, the A stands for appropriate, the N stands for numerical, the D is doable, and the O is obstacles considered. So when we say to a student, you know, you need to implement a can-do goal, we take them through these five steps, and they have to, they have to actually systematically review these for all these areas. So an example, the long-term goal for this um, middle or high school student is I want to get earn a B plus in math this year. Okay. Now B plus in math might be doable if the student has been getting C's or B's. But if a student's been failing or getting a D, it's a, we, the, they really have to, I uh, have to figure out what their short-term goals are and with their long-term goals and whether this is doable or whether their goal should be to earn a B or a B minus. So the short-term goals are to study, and then what are they gonna to do to reach these goals? So for the student, I need to study for 30 minutes a day. So let's look at this. Help make your goal doable by listing three steps needed to achieve it. I wanna improve my score on the next math test by 10 points. So what are the steps for reaching the goals, right? The goal is doable because there are three steps listed to help achieve it. Study for 30 minutes a day is the first step. Make flashcards to practice four times a week is the second step. Review my notes from class every night is another step. And then if my goal then is reached, should be reached, improve my math score by 10 points. So can do goals, we said what's doable. Now, what are the obstacles, the O in can do? What are some obstacles that might get in the way of reaching the goal? Well, studying for 30 minutes a day, I left my notes at school, so I didn't have anything to study with. Make flashcards to practice four times a week. I got busy with other work and I didn't review my flashcards. Review my notes from class every night. What was the obstacle? I couldn't do the homework because I didn't understand it. And improve my score by 10 points, is that possible? So what are some ways to overcome obstacles? So we get kids to think through all of these steps that can do uh, in terms of those can do that list. Um, and the last thing in terms of obstacles is how are you gonna overcome those obstacles? What are you gonna do? So it's considering the obstacles and figuring out a way of overcoming them. But right, I forgot my notes in school. Now I get the student to think about, well, what's he gonna do if he forgot his notes? Well, I'll spend extra time studying the next night or study during a fleet free block. The second obstacle was I didn't understand my, the lesson and I couldn't do my homework. So what you, what's he gonna do? Talk to the teacher the next day or ask a friend or parent for help. I was too busy with other work. Make up studying time on the weekends, in the morning, before school, or during a free block. So you can see that in terms of these obstacles, you, we systematically get them to 
figure out what steps they're going to take to overcome these obstacles. And by thinking through all these steps, you're actually getting them to become metacognitive and to be set focus on their goals and to focus on whether or not those goals are achievable. Because so often students and adults set goals that are totally unachievable. Like, as I said, well, I want to be the class valedictorian when they aren't sort of anywhere that, that in that league. Or, um, you know, I want to get all A's when in fact, currently they're getting C's in most of their work. So it's setting reasonable goals where they consider what's doable um, and then consider the obstacles and consider ways of overcoming the obstacles. So that's an example from Can Do Goals. Let me show you an, another example from SMARTS, which is organizing and prioritizing time, just so you have a sense of it. So as we all know, we, we all live this right now, right? We often have so many have to's and our want to list just doesn't get addressed. So we want to do a lot of things and we don't end up doing them because we have so many things that we have to do. And there's this tug of war. What am, how am I going to spend my weekend when I, you know, you have to grade papers and you have to prepare your lessons for the following week and you have to go grocery shopping and you have to mow the lawn and what you really want to do is read a book. So how do you put your weekend around those? So considering the have tos and want tos and teaching kids to balance those from the earliest grades. So getting Fred to write down a list of his have, to, have tos and want tos. Read for 20 minutes, start a book report, play Fortnite, go to karate, ride a bike, practice piano. So what are the have-tos and what are the want-tos? And getting him to list them. So the have-tos are that he has to start a book report. He has to read for 20 minutes. He has to practice the pen. His want-tos are playing fortune, riding his back and going to karate. And so as part of that daily plan, he then has to go through what we do in SMARTS is we give kids a planner and we say, okay, now go through your planner and list out the have-tos first. You need to put that in your planner first. You start the day at 7.30 in the morning, going to the evening. Uh, this is a weekend where you'd be in school and put in your have-tos and then add in your want-tos as well as meal times and breaks for sports, etc. And then figure out if you have enough time to address the have-tos. So this is an activity that gets kids to begin to prioritize, to begin to organize, to begin to figure out what's important, how to balance them, and how to sort of, rather than saying, I have a weekend and waiting till Sunday night to start their homework, which leads to that Sunday night nightmare for parents and families. So all this links to executive function, metacognition. These are the kinds of strategies that you can that you, um, you can teach. And as I said, our SMARTS curriculum has 30 of these lessons. They don't have to be ta ta taught in order. You can teach them in any order. If you have the class profile for your students and you have a sense of what, okay, what do I prioritize? Um, but you can use, you can teach these strategies using, you know, system that you've developed. The time, the important thing is to help your students to understand who they are as learners, to understand their strengths and weaknesses, and to then understand the importance of teaching these strategies systematically and in a structured way. So all of these, once you have taught all of these issues, as I've said, you're gonna be building, reducing kids' anxiety, as you saw from those video clips from, from Ben and from Chase, and, um, from all those quotes that I gave you, and you're building resilience and academic success. So I wanted you, this last activity that we have at Caitlin's gonna take you through is to answer these, to rate yourselves on a one to five scale on these resilience items. So over to you, Caitlin. Thank you. 
So here we go. Looking here, we have about um, 14 responses so far, and about 70% of respondents um, identified that they are good at bouncing back after a problem, but now about 30% say um, that no, that that might not be one of their strengths. Um, here for number question two, I don't let problems stop me from reaching my goals. The majority, 90% of people said, yes, they, they don't let problems stop them from reaching their goals. Here for question three, when I have a setback, I remain optimistic that I can figure it out. About three quarters said, yes, they, they can remain optimistic that I can figure it out. And for question four, when I'm in a challenging situation, I find a way to get around it. Almost 100%, about 96% said yes. Thank you to everyone for responding to, to this survey and to all the surveys. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so you're very, so um, I'm trying to go back to screen share. This says this will stop other screen sharing. Okay. Yes. So you just share that. Um, as you saw, um, most of you are saying, which was interesting, you, that you don't let problems stop you from reaching your goals, which is wonderful. So you're a very, very resilient group that's very flexible because that's cognitive flexibility that I'll be talking about next week with Tana. And um, that you determine to find a way to get around it. As we're um, living in this in this very uncertain time with this pandemic and the stresses of teaching in school, this form of resilience obviously is very important because you're being required to flex, to think flexibly every single day. You're being pushed to the limits you, and, and you're being required to be very resilient, to remain optimistic, to find a way around an issue and to bounce back if there's a problem. And so are your students. So, um, think about these issues as you work with your students and think about the importance of building this metacognitive awareness and executive and teaching these executive function strategies. Because by teaching those strategies so that kids know that they need to be flexible, know that they need to organize and prioritize, know that they need to self-monitor and how to do it, that will build that, reduce that anxiety, reduce that stress and build that resilience. And I'll talk about the saying the stress and the um, resilience issue in more detail next week. So your goal is to help your students to get to the top of the mountain, pushing that boulder to the top that requires executive function strategies, what we call focused effort knowing where you're going and knowing how you're going to somehow they get that boulder up, up that mountain and to the top and a huge amount of determination and persistence and resilience. Um, and that's what you want to foster in your students. You want to teach them, you want to empower your students to learn how to learn. When you teach them how to understand how they learn, what their personal challenges and, and strengths are in these areas, how to get around those challenges, what strategies they can use, how to share with other students in your class, in their classes, so that they recognize that this, that they can learn from one another, that they can, that these strategies are important. And most important, if you can use those strategy reflection sheets on a with, with your kids when you give your students homework and studying for tests and taking tests and you give them extra credit for using them, that will promote this metacognitive awareness. And it'll begin the whole cycle of teaching kids to use these strategies so that they do become resilient, so that they do focus, so that they do um, persist and so they can be successful. So, um, I apologize. Um, so to end, I just want to remind you, um, I'm not sure what this is. I just want to remind you um, that we're trying to, sorry, I want to just go back if I can. Oh gosh, For some reason or other my, there you go. I just want to remind you of this um, 
model, this paradigm that I showed you at the beginning, that what you're trying to build, what we're trying to build are these executive function strategies in combination with metacognition, effort, self-concept, and emotional regulation will result when students understand how they learn and when they understand what strategies work best for them. Then they will become more self-confident. There will be less, there will be fewer behavior problems. So that social emotional regulation will happen. There will be, you will be building their resilience and they will eventually be successful academically and in life. And that's your goal. That's all of our goal as educators is to help our students to succeed as learners in life. Um, and as you go through this year, sort of on a tightrope in terms of challenges and stresses, which are out of all of our control. I hope that you will, that some of these strategies that you will think about for yourselves in terms of the power of these strategies and be able to implement them in your own lives, because I think that they help us all as we sort of try to navigate and, to, and balance all these various different priorities that we're facing. So I'd like to end there. If you had, um, please contact us at our institute if you have any questions about the work we do, about our executive function, about SMARTS. I hope that all of you will take a look at our SMARTS curriculum. There's a lot of um, totally free resources there. We have a lot of blogs. We have a lot of information available. And I hope that some of you will decide that you too will become, will subscribe to SMARTS, become SMARTS users, and become part of our growing family of SMARTS users across the country and across and around the world. Um, so that we can, you can share strategies with one another because you sort of often are the, the most creative in terms of coming up with ideas and suggestions for your students. So at this point, we have about 20 minutes and, I, and um, I we could take questions through the chat that Caitlin will monitor. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions and, and to have other people comment as well. Well, great. I, I think to get us started, there is a question about, um, could you comment more on the connection between executive function and social emotional learning, which is such, um, you know, a big topic of conversation these days? Sure. Um, I just have a question for Diana and for, and for Jeff. Um, should we, should I take the PowerPoint off? And if people want to would be great if we could see some people's faces. If I don't know if you if if you can do that, but it would be nice to be able to um, to share if we can. Um, we do have this is in a webinar format, so if uh -oh. people raise if but if they raise their hand, I we are able to unmute them if they would like to ask a question. So it looks like we do have. Whoops, I just lost her. Looks like Gloria had her hand raised, but maybe she took it down. <laughs> um, but yes, we do have that ability. So if somebody would like to ask a question live, they are able to raise their hand and we can unmute them. Okay, great. Um, so just so, so people remember, um, could you, Caitlin, do you wanna just repeat that question so, so that people remember what it was? <laughs> Or of course. Um, so the question is asking if you could comment more on the connection between executive function and social emotional learning, which is um, such a big topic of conversation these days. Well, it's as you saw from those various slides that I showed you, the paradigms as well as the, the slide which showed the relationship between emotional regulation, executive function, attention and effort. Um, they're huge, they are interrelated in a huge way. And as you, as I showed, and the samples I showed you right through, the examples of Ben's, the quotes from Ben and from other students, um, if when students have executive function, when they know what they have to, what they, what they can do to change their academic, to change their learning or to change their approach to whatever tasks they have, and they understand what their strengths and weaknesses are, 
their anxiety and their stress are reduced. And so they became, so therefore behavioral outbursts, if, that, if it's a student who does have those issues are going to be reduced. They feel more in control and they feel like they um, can be successful and just feeling like they can be successful then is a part of that social emotional learning. They, because it reduces the behavioral outbursts and it reduces the anxiety and it reduces the stress. So from our perspective, the two are very, very strongly interlinked. Um, and when you build these executive function strategies, you are really working on indirectly on social emotional learning and building it for students. Um, I hope that answers, addresses that question. Great, thank you. There's another question um, about whether or not we've used these strategies with students who have high and intensive needs, such as autism or emotional or behavioral disabilities. And so the answer is yes. <laughs> For students with, uh, on the spectrum, with ASD, on, with ASD, their big issue is that they need a huge amount of structure. They need instruction to be very explicit. They need to have broken down and they need strategies for getting through this. So these kinds of executive function strategies are even more important for students with ASD. The pace of teaching the strategies might be different. You might have to do much more repetition, much more review. Um, but the strategies per se are critically important and make a difference. So I just want to add, and this is the issue when we, because some of your special education teachers, some of your general ed teachers, you all sort of cross the grades. What we have found and what, what um, others have found both, we and our work is both clinical with sort of students with issues and also in terms of the research domain where we've implemented these strategies in terms of large schools and looked at sort of had control groups is that these, these strategies benefit all students. Every student in the classroom benefits from these strategies, but they're essential for students with learning and attention issues and, and for students with ASD. So for students who have all some, some types of learning challenges, these strategies make an even bigger difference. And sometimes they need more review, they need more, um, they need, need the strategies to be repeated more, they need more practice, but they and they make a huge difference, but they make a huge difference, a big difference for all students. All students benefit from this kind of strategy instruction, which is why our SMARTS curriculum is focused targets the general education curriculum, the general education classroom. It's not just the special ed. <laughs> A curriculum. Thank you. Um, another question. So regarding the peer mentoring, what, um, what tips or, or best practices would you recommend for having peers work with each other on developing um, their strategy use? Yeah, great question. Um, one of the books that I edited with Karen Harris is on peer tutoring in the classroom. So uh, you might be interested in taking a look at that. Um, but in terms of, you can use this in a more um, formal structured way as well as, a, as well as in a very much, a much less formal approach. We actually developed a whole peer tutoring, peer coaching curriculum that, but we have not yet had the funding to put it online and make it available to everyone. I wish, you know, hopefully it'll happen in the future. Um, in the classroom, you've got obviously got students who are the same age and this, but are different levels. So as I'd said earlier, what you can do is you can match them in terms of pairing them. The idea being that in one, for one task, one student will be the mentor and for another uh, task, they'll switch roles. Um, and what you would do is, for example, you could start with strategy reflection sheets, have them assign that to the whole class. Students take the if students go home and they do the homework, they have to write down what their strategy is. They can come in and share the strategy with each other and then help each other to implement the strategy in an academic in another test that you assign on that day as part of their classwork. Or if you do some review, if you do some review 
at the end of the class or the beginning of the class, they could work with each other on in terms of showing show and tell. I use the strategy. I use a strategy. Okay, how could we how could we both practice it? So there are a whole lot of different ways that you can use depending on how structured or unstructured you want it. You want it to be, and then the class share, the strategy share I talked about, and the strategy boards are where the whole class. Uh, working together, sharing with one another uh, um, what strategies have worked for them. And in terms of the peer coaching, you can break them up. You can, you know, have students in pairs and can use and can have them, you know, over the course of a week, do like three different activity, three different examples, activities as part of the classwork that you're assigning. Um, or you can have it over the course of two weeks. You can be as formal or as informal as you choose to. There have been a couple questions about applying these strategies to a preschool population. Um, so as we talked about at the beginning, <laughs> uh, there's gonna be a fourth session um, that focuses specifically on preschool, which is why I didn't, and I did not, which is why I didn't address it today at all. You know at all but these at the preschool level executive function is also very important in terms of how kids think um but as we know when they're not being taught they at the preschool level kids aren't being required to to meet the same kinds of structured <laughs> requirements that um, older kids are and in the preschool level the biggest issue in terms of executive function is what we call self-regulation because kids will misbehave, will shout out, will, you know, will run around the classroom um, unless they learn sort of some self-regulation uh, strategies, meaning being able to think about how they think, saying to themselves, I have to stop and before I do something and um, reflect. They're not going to, you're not going to use that word with a preschooler, but think about it, stop think, then do. Um, so it's that self-regulation that's actually the most important and it's the most important for behavior for behavior in the, in the preschool setting. Um, and you're beginning to teach things like organizing and prioritizing, even when they, when kids walk in, you know, you're always getting them to put their hats and coats on the same hook <laughs> um, or take it, you know, at, and their, um, and their little backpacks on the same area of the day. So that's organizing, prioritizing, bringing, you know, bringing their lunch in and so on. So these strategies do apply, but in a very different way. And you'll learn more about it in the fourth session, four weeks. Um, a question about how the Metacog surveys differ from other executive function assessment tools. So, um, I'm not sure which executive function surveys you're thinking of. Maybe the brief. The brief is the most widely known. Um, that's a 92-item questionnaire. As you know, it's it's very detailed and it's very lengthy. And in our experience with teachers, often feel like it's a burden to have to complete um, and have students complete because it's, it's so long. It's a very good questionnaire, but that's more of a whole diagnostic tool. Our executive function survey is designed to be short to be very practical for use in the classroom. And, um, and now to generate this profile and to be linked with strategies that can be, so it's, it's teamed with strategies that can be specifically taught. So if a student, as you saw, has weaknesses in self-monitoring and self-checking, it's like these are strategies that can be most helpful for the student, or if, you know, if the majority of your class has weaknesses in that area, these are the strategies that would be most helpful. Most of the other, well, not, none of the surveys that I know of are specifically team good strategies. And also they're, they're longer and, um, and take more time. Um, the work that we've done on the Metacog, by the way, I first published in 2004, um, has high reliability and validity and we have adjusted and just edited the questions over time as part of sort of a lot of a large number of classroom studies. So taking feedback from teachers in terms of, I just don't have the time 
to use this? What can we use that's very, that's brief and that's usable and that's practical and it's user-friendly? And that, those are the guidelines that we've used to develop our questionnaires and um, to keep testing them and keep refining them and keep analyzing uh, their relationship with academic performance. Someone is wondering what ages can the Metacog surveys be used with? So the current one, the one that we're um, that we've put online is, and by the way, it's available right now in a hard copy through our institute, through our website, has been for a while, but um, it's for middle to high school students. Well, we have a lot of teachers who use it for fourth and fifth grade students, and that's also fine. And we use it clinically, even for some third graders, but definitely not for first and second graders. We will at some stage develop a version for them because you need smiley faces and you just need the language to be to be much simpler and the task to be simpler. Um, so we tend to, so most people, as I say, it, theoretically it's middle and high school students, but really a lot of fourth, fifth grade teachers and even third grade use it. Great. Um, there's a question about um, how lack of motivation is a huge barrier to introducing students to working with EF strategies. Um, often students say, oh, I don't need this. Um, what are your suggestions to share, to motivate middle school students particularly to start working with um, EF strategies? Yeah, great question. And I know that's a question I get a lot when I give a presentation. Um, and, and the point that I always make is that kids will use strategies when they experience success. So if there's some way that you can team your strategy and instruction with success, that, that makes a huge difference. That means for kids getting that extra credit on a test for, on a test grade because they've used a strategy or they've, um, they've completed a strategy reflection sheet. And even if they haven't been entirely successful on, um, on the total implementation, the fact that they're using the strategy and that they're refining it makes a, is, is something that they should be getting credit for. So this is why it becomes really important in the general classroom, as well as if, for those of you who are teaching in special education, to be teaming with the general education teachers so that they see, so that your students see the crossover. You know, if they learning the strategy um, with in special as part of a special education setting. Students often say, oh, I use that strategy with Mrs. Brown, but, I don't, but then I go back into the other, into English language arts and I don't need to use it. Well, that's not the case. So they had that, that, that tie-in is really important. And that's why, that's the strength of the strategy instruction that if all the students are using strategy in the class and the teachers requiring them is giving extra credit for, you know, a writing assignment or a math assignment or a reading or a history assignment because the students have used a strategy or explained how they've used a strategy. That's what makes the difference. So any way that you can add extra credit or grade them, increase the grade, or show them the relationship, they will be, it, it makes a huge, huge difference. And once they've succeeded once, they will use it. You saw those quotes from Ben, and I mean, through my talk, like he, when I, he understood what was going on and he knew where to spend more time. <clears throat> or when he, I know there was an, I didn't show you that quote, but that, you know, when he took a test and for the first time in his life got an A minus because he'd used a strategy that was sort of a total, for him, that was like the best sort of day of his life, it's like, oh, now I know if I use this, I can be successful. So there is a bit of a learning curve for kids, a persuasion curve too. <laughs> um, but if, but they, once they've used it and they've succeeded in a small way and then you build that success, those successes. Um, there's a question about, about smarts and, and the way, um, the way the subscription model, the question is um, why it's priced for a year in that way um, in the subscription model. Um, 
Well, it is a subscription model where you sort of renew after your school system renews. Um, once you've used it, it's a much lower, it's a lower price for the renewal. Uh, and we each year we try to add additional features so it's strengthened. Um, and that's because we've changed, we change it over time. So each year we try to sort of add like what we did with SMARTS and with the SMARTS elementary curriculum, like this year, this summer, we um, sort of added on sort of additional components to the SMARTS elementary curriculum so that it's, it, it's, um, it has more options, more opportunities. We added on, um, we broke up the lessons into grouping. So if, if a teacher wants to teach in a certain grouping, it tells you exactly what lessons to use. Um, teachers love these various opportunities with us regular smart curriculum one year we sort of added additional a huge amount of additional content in terms of relationship to the curriculum so each year there are we try to sort of have changes but as with most online programs they're, sub they're subscription based they're not sort of a static and and um you know forever <laughs> it's just like curriculum Thank you. And there is a question specifically about a strategy. So about can-do goals, how does one monitor progress of the goal um, after setting the can-do goal and going through the steps? How does one return to it and monitor the progress? Well, remember students are setting their goals. So it's not up to, it's not you as a teacher, it's the student setting that goal, recognizing what the obstacles are, and then um, whether they've reached their goal. So if their goal is to get a B plus in, in a test and they don't get it, they have to go back to, okay, what did I did? What did, what didn't I do? You know, where did I, where did I fall down? Um, and, and reevaluating those obstacles and then figuring out sort of different strategies. Well, I obviously didn't work for 20 minutes a day because I, you know, I got distracted. I was sort of, <laughs> I was on social media with my friends. You know, I decided to take an hour's two hour break and I got to it too late, those kinds of things. So it's students. And as part of the, within the classroom, within the special classroom discussions amongst the students. Uh, and this is where the peer mentoring can come in too where students can team up in pairs and talk about whether or not they met their goals for, you know, that week or two days. And it's this medical, once again, what you're doing is you're getting kids to think about how they're thinking and think about how they're learning. Well, I, I don't have any more questions uh, that have come in, Dina. I'm not sure um, if, if you have any others. Well, I think um, I, I noticed I we're on 7.30, so, right? You're good. I, I don't see any specific questions. Some of them are mainly related to um, links for, um, which the links have been posted in the chat for when this recording is made available. Um, it will probably take just a couple of days to get um, closed captioning added. Um, and the evaluation, it looked like somebody was having an error, an error message. So. We will be sending that out to all registered participants so that they can also um, capture the evaluation in the email in case you're having issues in the chat. And we will be saving the chat um, just, and we will also be staying on here for just a few minutes extra to let you go back and capture anything in the chat that you would like to as well. Um, Dr. Meltzer, this has been phenomenal. Um, your expertise and your time, it, I, we just, we thank you so much. It